your videos on so if you could shut down your videos uh, uh, now that would be that would be okay Shall we start? Yes. Good evening. First of all, apologies for the delay in starting the session and also for the technical errors and all the inconvenience caused because of the change of link in uh, registering for this much anticipated webinar. We are going to start by um, thanking our speakers and the audience for being very patient with all of the errors. In a socially distanced world, Design United is an optimistic digital platform for collaborative design and connection. Welcome to Design United's eighth design conversation in conversation with designers Eugene Koskoron and Studio Unbuild. I'm Varna Shashidar, founder principal of a regional landscape practice, VSLA, based in Bengaluru. I am supported by Clayworks Spaces in this endeavor. Clayworks creates flexible workspaces that focuses on productivity and sustainability. I'm also supported by the Design United team in this endeavor. The main aim behind Design United is to create an optimistic space for regional dialogue, connections, collaborations, and opportunities for young designers and design practices. A much needed network of support and peer mentorship during these uncertain times. The selected designers and design studios who we've invited are working on innovative approaches to design and also have a deep resonance with the place they are from. They believe in genuinely contributing to the environment and the design community. We've had wonderful young designers and moderators from the region in our past conversations. We have had Bogar Studio and Studio Made, Arnai Studio, be Polite, Compartment S4, Architect Avinash Ankalge from India, Kavan Balasurya, an artist from Sri Lanka, Studio Neba and Kolpa World from Nepal. We've also had theorists and architects uh, Vaishnavi Shukri joining us from uh, Cambridge, Ishita Shah joining us from Bengaluru. We will soon be starting a new mentorship segment to design conversation on this coming um, June 27th, Saturday, with architects Nisha Matthew Ghosh from India and architect Min Wee from Sarawak, Malaysia, moderated by two young designers from Bangalore and Colombo. We're also introducing a new segment in July in progress, featuring new practices with projects in progress, discussing their work and their approach. So our first speaker in this conversation will be Para Studio with Harshit Nayak and Priyanka Rastugi joining us in July. So please continue to join us every week on Saturdays at the same time, 4.30 for the conversation. With this background to Design United, let's move to the presentations and conversations which are much awaited today. I'm really delighted to welcome our presenting designers for this evening. Architect Eugene Koskoron joining us from Singapore and Studio Unbuild joining us from Mumbai. Their presentations will be followed by a moderated discussion. So please do type in audience questions for the designers, which will be answered in the discussion that will follow the presentation. I'm delighted to welcome our two speakers today, Studio Unbuilt, which is an architectural and design practice established by Nishant Mehta, Varun Goel, 
and Ria Seth in Mumbai. Nishant and Varun, the two partners, are graduates from KRVA Mumbai and GSAP New York and Manit Bhopal. Ria is an interior designer and a graduate from the SEPT University. Their firm's practice celebrates their first anniversary this month, so congratulations. The firm is a multidisciplinary practice and encompasses urban design, architecture, interior design, product and graphic design. Currently working on a spectrum of projects. They, they approach their work as attempts to reveal latent spaces of everyday reality. Welcome Ria, Nishant and Varun. Our second speaker for today is Eugene Koskaron, joining us from Singapore. Eugene graduated from the Southern California Institute of Architecture with a master's from the EST program. After graduating from um, SEAC in 2012, Eugene has worked extensively in America uh, prior to joining Formworks, uh, architects based in Singapore. His work investigates material behaviors and establishes custom representational techniques for their graphic communication. Welcome, Eugene. Our first presentation for the day will be Eugene Koskaron from Singapore. Thank you, Orna. Okay. All right, so I suppose you guys could see my screen? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> Hi, um, thanks for the introduction. Um, <clears throat> the title for today's presentation uh, for this webinar, I guess, is called No Sense People. It kind of describes um, what uh, both myself and my team believe in, where um, <clears throat> we are trained in architecture, but also we find that while we're trying to collaborate with different uh, people from a different background, say product interior or graphic, uh, they tend to be a distinction where everybody's in their own uh, specific silos. And then it's very hard for cross uh, discipline behaviors to happen, <clears throat> uh, where we actually picture that uh, it will be a much more richer environment if this was encouraged. So uh, John luc Picard from uh, the Star Trek Enterprise kind of says it best, it makes no sense at all for each of us to kind of like just be divided and stay in within our own silos. And that's why no sense people kind of came about because the work that we do um, kind of bridges all these disciplines. And I hope through the few projects I'm showing today, they would kind of uh, show what I'm talking about. So a little bit of background is uh, I do work uh, I, with a lot of architectural firms and I have uh, an architectural training as a background. Uh, but I also do a lot of machining, fabrication, and computation, which allows me to understand how to do tra tra uh, combine, say, traditional craft with kind of like a digital computational intelligence. Um, I'm going to take you through six projects quickly. Uh, so Echo is a series of paintings, uh, and then the furnitures and a few sculptures that I've been doing since I joined Paul. So Echo started in 2013 when I was selected as an artist in residence. Um, this was about a year after I graduated from my master's in Los Angeles. Uh, I was given a free play on what I wanted to do. And <clears throat> I want to pick up what I was working on in my master's, which was uh, using robots to kind of do three-dimensional taping. And that came into a series of painting called Echo. Uh, so what's really um, interesting was like uh, to paint this, uh, it requires a few months of basically layering, taping, uh, paint using spray paints and um, repeating the process and doing uh, permutations to it. 
Now, when we do a painting like this, one of the issues is we cannot really predict what the final outcome is. So this is where the digital aspect actually comes into play really strongly. Uh, and after a few months, uh, you rip the whole paintings off and then you see this, <clears throat> uh, the final results or whatever that was, that is, that was kind of like predicted in the digital world. So uh, this became an interesting thing where I wanted to create a digital physical feedback loop. So what's on the left is kind of the plotting idea on how we do the paintings and what's on the right is the painting itself which is made uh, out of like uh, circular masking tapes. Uh, and there are some logics that are being applied into this. <clears throat> These uh, paintings start from the middle and then they expand towards the ends. Uh, and there's a growth algorithm that's being incorporated into each one of these paintings. While this, the square ones start from the edges and finishes into the middle space. So what is really interesting is <clears throat> the mechanics behind it, which is something that um, as a kind of like technically trained person uh, is very interesting to me. So doing a chart is super important to kind of understand the materials that uh, I'm going to require to do this, the layering system, the colors that's going to be placed, uh, and the count on each one of these layers kind of similar to how we do architecture and we predict how much material we're going to use to do a building. Um, <clears throat> all these logics are kind of translated to these main things. Uh, this one's called day and it's uh, basically a simple diagram, but by understanding how we permutate um, the blackest spot on each one of the painting uh, with a logic that comes across, you will read it as a one, two, three, from left to right, it allows the painting to kind of have uh, slight movements, uh, which uh, is a, basically it's the same logic, but by tweaking little things, it allows us to create this movement, which a lot of times we want to get in architecture. Those paintings translate into other projects too. So this was back in 2015 when I was working for Lecker Architects. We were approached by the National Gallery to um, kind of do their furnitures for the public seating. And they had a lot of old furnitures that were there. So the building is basically that they're, they're trying to, was done by Studio Migu. <clears throat> and they're trying to kind of like join two old kind of like capital buildings uh, by using kind of like a metal mesh to bridge them across. So understanding that the design kind of like follows that cue where it does not want to overpower the site or the architecture. And we wanted to create a series that looks from something from the old to the new. So whatever you see on the left, which starts off with the brown uh, furnitures, they're the, uh, <clears throat> they're the original and these are the permutation on how they turn into kind of like the new stuff. Uh, <clears throat> these are the individual chairs. The ones on the left is a baronial chair uh, and the ones on the right is on scholar chair. So for these, we just replace the cushions uh, with basically teak and then do uh, kind of like a simpler paint job for them. Uh, the next one is um, <clears throat> kind of like the ones that they are, will be located at the top area and it's kind of like creating kind of like a sweeping solution to it. So how to cut the benches and incorporate a new piece to allow this kind of like curved behavior. And it would be placed really nicely on certain corners in the National Gallery too. And on this last one is four individual chairs that's kind of like joined together and uh, the bottom is made out of a perforated metal mesh that's anodized. Um, this one's uh, basically another sculpture that was being done in <clears throat> Shenzhen 2018. So this is one of the first projects I work with in Formworks. So Bright is a sculpture that <clears throat> Uh, was commissioned uh, to us. Uh, basically, uh, Formworks was curating a technological festival. It's called the Shenzhen 01 Technology Festival. So this 
So the idea was to create a marker at the entrance of the site so everybody knows where the festival grounds are. We wanted to do that by um, keeping it simple, uh, but at the same time having a more humane element to it instead of just a technological festival. So the Tower Bright <clears throat> is basically uh, a way for you to enter the festival grounds. A slit is created in between it so you can walk through it. And from plan, it looks like a zero. Uh, and on elevation, it looks like a one. Uh, so zero one uh, was kind of the binary code, uh, how the binary code starts. Uh, when you kind of like code 0011, you know, to create all the uh, earlier scripts. And we want to keep it simple in that way. Now, what we added into that is like, we wanted to add some experience to this. And that's where we hung 23 different size of uh, light rings in them. And we program a behavior that goes according to it. Uh, so this is, uh, on the right, you can see that's the festival grounds, and you kind of enter through this middle area to um, through the sculpture that kind of looks um, pretty prominent in the day. Uh, but we also wanted to create a different behavior to it, where in the <clears throat> in the evening the the sculpture can take on a very different behavior. So uh, we started to think about how can we actually do this, and um, by hanging these 23 lights, we're able to work with a lighting programmer to program a breathing behavior. So it kind of behaves like a pulse, um, <clears throat> uh, where it acts kind of like a rib cage on the outside. And on the inside, there's this kind of like pulsing behavior of light. So even if you're not familiar with what the behavior is, it's instinctively something that you kind of do. And that would allow people to kind of like be more engaged in the experience as you walk through um, this tower. Uh, following that was uh, <clears throat> a curation job that uh, my team did um, for Singapore, which is in Singapore 2019. It happened in March. It was for Singapore Design Week. So we were tasked to do a um, installation in this uh, National Design Center, which is about four stories deep uh, atrium space with a beautiful skylight. Uh, so the first thing that came to my mind was uh, there were other exhibitions happening there and I didn't want the uh, installation to actually overpower the rest of the things. Uh, so Twisted Paths is kind <clears> of <throat> something uh, that came about with this uh, understanding of the context of the site. Uh, it's done by, uh, we're also given a pretty low budget. So we do it by using, hanging two millimeter uh, thick nylon strings. Um, and we gave uh, the client uh, basically two proposals, one that we hung and one that kind of like just grounded. Um, so in the end, we, we really like the ones that's grounded, but the client was like, well, no, um, we prefer the ones that be hung. And by <clears throat> hanging them diagonally, uh, it allows you to have different uh, forms and um, how different forms and different way of interpretation, interpreting the sculpture as you walk around the building. So it's made out of three layers, uh, three distinctive layers, uh, 480 lines uh, that is hung across 160 per layer. And by using computation, we're able to create an Excel sheet that uh, tells us exactly what the lengths of each members are. And this allows us to kind of also dictate how we want to hang them. And the structure um, frame uh, above, we also kind of like 
uh, punctured holes in them so we can actually thread these in to kind of like create a much more cleaner detail to things. Uh, so the end product is something that's kind of like soft and ethereal and it fills up the kind of like the four story atrium in a very nice and clean way. And it's really interesting when light hits it and the shadow kind of falls on it, it kind of allows these strings to kind of like disappear in moments too. Yeah. Boulder was also something that uh, we kind of made for uh, the same festival, Singaporeal. Uh, is when we start working with a laminate company and they were like, oh, you know, we'll give you a budget and you can do whatever you want, which is the best kind of clients that we can ever hope for. Uh, so one of the things they wanted to look at was how do we challenge the perception of laminate? Laminate, uh, as we know, is a sheet material that's kind of like two-dimensional, made out of paper and resin, and normally is used uh, to mimic a finish, whether it's a wood, a stone, metal, and is primarily used interior to be used for cabinets. Um, but once interesting is like laminate is always associated with a substrate, which is like a plywood, uh, a backing that you glue it onto. So we wanted to see what we can do to celebrate laminate, since it's a laminate company, by leaving the substrate and reimagining it. So we did a bunch of tests. Um, how can we manipulate laminate from a two-dimensional to a three-dimensional form? Uh, these were earlier tests that came with failures on the left. And on the right, that's uh, Pamela, who's kind of like putting the pieces together using 3D printed joints. By <clears throat> analyzing and studying it over a period of four months, we were able to understand the bending logic of these laminates. By heating it, uh, we were able to make the resin malleable. And by cutting uh, kind of like seams into it, we can create curve folding that allows us to kind of like make these three-dimensional shapes. Tests were being done on the different types of tabs, uh, the different types of lengths and this kind of allows us to have a median on like what are the shapes that we can do and what are shapes that we cannot do. Okay, so I guess, and then of course we created this so-called physical uh, digital feedback loop, which is something I believe in. Um, <clears throat> so I started this with the paintings and I kind of apply it to all the projects uh, by enabling ourselves to take um, the material investigations and inputting them into uh, software, we are able to kind of like calculate what are the things that will work for us and what are the things that will not work for us. Uh, so this sculpture was made out of 473 different pieces. And <clears throat> by using uh, parametric equations, we're able to kind of predict the shape, uh, <clears throat> unroll them, so we can actually generate the cut files and label them um, kind of like in an automated fashion, uh, which helps us save a lot of time. Okay. So the result is kind of like um, an understanding on like what happens when you combine kind of material investigation with uh, kind of like a computation aspect of things. So we presented this um, during the Singapore Design Week and a bunch of people from UNESCO came by and it was quite interesting because we haven't seen laminate done this way in the past 25 years. Uh, then the last thing that I'm gonna show is uh, Grow Spine, which is a project that was for Singapore Night Festival um, this year, but it got pushed back, I think, because of the COVID. So Grow a Spine came from um, the, the, the need for us to kind of like make a stand towards uh, environmental problems. And that was kind of one of the things that kind of drive the project through. So uh, Singapore Night Festival once uh, invited us to 
do a proposal for a kind of like a light sculpture for them. Uh, I wanted to make it as sustainable as possible because of uh, the current environmental issues. Uh, if we all know, like Greta Thunberg um, was in the news, the forest fires in Australia was very heartbreaking. And this was kind of one of the reasons um, why these sculptures was uh, created the way it is. Uh, Grow Spine basically is um, telling us as uh, humans that we should make a stand to things. And the material that I chose to work with is bamboo, so it could be fully recyclable. Uh, I met with a bunch of um, bamboo weavers in Indonesia, and I wanted to work with them exclusively to create this project. And it was really interesting because the logic in weaving is kind of similar to the logic in how I do my paintings uh, and most of my projects. So by <clears throat> introducing a new way to uh, so-called weave or um, kind of giving them a new logic, uh, we're able to kind of create this uh, sculpture that's derived from kind of like a spinal form. It's a short video. So, <clears throat> no sense people basically, uh, so summary is um, how I, uh, I perceive myself and my team is in the industry. Uh, we work with architects, we do products. Uh, we are very interested in technology and different ways of representing things, but we don't necessarily belong in one specific column. Uh, so by being a bit more multidisciplinary, I think the boundaries that the industry set for us is a little bit more of like a nonsense. Uh, if we are willing to challenge it, although it can be a little bit uh, difficult at times, <laughs> but it's always a fun thing for us to do. And this is kind of like what we imagine uh, the design industry should be like in a fun way. Thank you. Thank you, Eugene, for sharing your inspiring material investigations, um, urging us all to push design boundaries and your absolutely brilliant work. Um, you, kind words, kind words. The small projects, you know. Beautiful work. Um, the second presentation now uh, will be by Studio Unbuild, after which you can please share your questions for Eugene and Studio Unbuild. Thank you. I'll just share the screen. Uh, good evening, everyone. I hope uh, the screen is shared correctly. Um, I'm Nishant, the co-founder of Studio Unbuilt. We would like to thank Ms. Varna Shashida, Design United, and Clayworks for the very generous invitation today. Uh, also, thank you, Eugene, for showing us your wonderful work and agreeing to share space with us. And thank you, everyone, for taking out your time this evening to join us. My co-founder Varun and uh, Ria are with us today, as is our entire team. Uh, today we're showing our presentation titled Unbuilt, the process of building. Um, so uh, Studio Unbuilt was founded uh, by Varun and me last year in June. We recently completed a year in operations. Uh, we're backed by a fabulous team whose personal interests range from graphic design, flooring design, on all the way up to content writing. Uh, we, f we work out of a micro studio space based out of Bombay, but we feel that the physical space of the studio belies the scale of the projects that we undertake. 
the engagements that we've been involved in uh, spans the spectrum between the interest in product design, architecture, and with certain interest in urban design and landscape as well. Our scale ranges from designing of, of standalone pedestals to larger institutional buildings. Uh, through our work, we are always experimenting with the relation of the built versus the unbuilt. And we feel that that's the broader pedagogy under which the studio operates. Uh, we're constantly striving to dissipate the polarities of what constitutes the unbuilt and what constitutes the built. And we would like to kind of soften the thresholds that divide these two. And we feel that these become essential de design challenges that we face. Uh, while we go ahead in our work. In terms of organizing the presentation, we've done it in two parts. The first is a glimpse of the process that the studio follows while dealing with a new commission. And the second is an enunciation of that process through two of the projects that we're currently working on. So I'll start with the first one, which is the process. It always begins with uh, various site visits over a span of time, which allows us to mine tangible as well as intangible data from the site. This, is, uh, this gives us an innate understanding of the site as well as the surrounds. Uh, we try and immerse ourselves in getting the local ethos and the context right, as we feel our projects are not, a are not standalone happenstances, but they are a part of a larger built fabric. This is all backed by thorough, we would say, academic research. Uh, it all boils down to internal studio group discussions. So everyone from the team can present their findings and voice their concerns. These are often heated events in the studio. Uh, then what we are able to distill out of this is like a larger, broader concept for the project. And uh, what we do is, which is slightly, which we feel is interesting is we do an academic sort of design ex exercise where each person from the studio comes up with their own iterations for, for, for the commission. Uh, then that goes through a rigorous internal review or a jury process while each person presents their work. And through this, we're able to synthesize the best components from each of the ideas and get an overarching concept to the project. Then the onus lies on the project architect to take charge of the project and come up with the design solutions for the issues that we're facing. Uh, this is all done uh, through a rigorous act of physical model making, as well as um, as well as a material exploration that we undertake, including sampling and mockups. We also do a lot of design development, uh, which we try and make it as uh, videos, uh, which we feel are explainer videos, which work for clients as well. So this is one that we did, which shows the programmatic distribution of a house that we're doing. Each of, the, each of the spaces had to follow a certain principle of Vastu in terms of how it was arranged. So uh, we feel like these kind of uh, methods of explanation work really well in convincing the client. Uh, uh, this then leads down to getting physical drawings made for site. And that is also backed by a 3D development and understanding of the project itself. So, um, uh, we feel that uh, along with the physical drawings, like the contractors, as well as all the agencies involved, uh, understand better what we're trying to say where, uh, through these uh, 3D explorations and models. So this is for the same house again, where we are trying to articulate penetrations, kind of break up volumes, articulate, uh, like negotiate the space between what is built and what is not built, and then kind of layer it up with uh, the landscape as well as activating the roofscape. Um, this then boils down to uh, look and feel uh, illustrations that we have to make for the clients sometimes. And all of this, uh, through this process, we constantly engage in discussions with our consultants to keep refining our design process, as well as we also keep the end user looped in through these discussions, because we feel like uh, an active engagement with the end user will make a more viable product for them. And then this, this kind of boils down to the physical construction process on site. Um, we feel the explanation, uh, uh, we feel like the stages of our process are ever changing instrumentalities that inform us as designers when we intervene in the built fabric. And we'll take you through two of our projects. Uh, one of the projects is a school 
for the special for specially able students that we're doing in Palanpur in Gujarat. Um, the project is located in Palanpur in northern Gujarat, which is characterized by a hot, dry, and arid region. It's close to the border with Rajasthan. It used Palanpur used to be a formerly princely state, and it's famous for its diamond jewelry and black and white photography. This is the kind of fabric of the older fortified city. We kind of carefully studied the fenestrations and articulations that we were that we found in the city. Uh, this is the existing campus within which we had to intervene. It's a large verdant campus. The, the, the buildings have workshops, uh, dedicated workshops for students to kind of hone in their talent, as well as uh, the structure already has, a, it, it almost has a dialogue with the surroundings already. So these were things that we kind of built on. Uh, so what we, what we were presented with uh, what we what we studied carefully was a tight plot. We had to deal with municipal setbacks, tree coverage, and a large programmatic and volumetric uh, this thing uh, with a lot with studies of sand path as well as a uh, wind direction. Uh, while studying, uh, researching our end users, these were very special end users. So we had to be careful with the anthropometric requirements for each disability, whether it was visual, hearing. Uh, uh, physical or, or as well as mental disabilities. And this, uh, through these intense discussions, we had to come up with our own anthropometric understandings of what the scope of design would be. Uh, we were able to synthesize this as creating a, a sort of socially inclined architecture with universal design guidelines and a careful understanding of climate and vegetation and an extensive employment of local material to keep costs absolutely low. Uh, we started with the mass with massing the requirements of the school and extrapolating the, our data from it. Uh, what we did was we, we did we did an interesting design exercise where each of the people in the studio assumed one form of disability, and we were able to mind map those disabilities into drawings. So this would be a mind map of someone who is visually challenged. Um, this is for someone who's hearing who's hearing impaired. For someone who is physically challenged, uh, for someone who is um, autistic, and then we were able to kind of synth synthesize these together um, to come up with um, with a with a design section which which worked uh, with the context as well. Programmatically, the the distribution was quite simple, where we where we uh, house the larger public programs on the ground floor and the quieter spaces of learning uh, about them. This was buffered on the southern end with a circulation block that consists, consisted of a ramp as well as a double height corridor space. But we imagine these, how each of these programs will be, will be populated with activities, as well as how uh, tactile flooring patterns would allow seamless navigation through the project. Uh, signage was carefully articulated and that would help aid navigation through the project as well. We utilize our build form to, to amplify the echo, which, which we found was very useful for partially hearing impaired students. We also utilize the double height corridors, corridor spaces for great vo uh, visual connections throughout. Uh, skylights were punctured through these corridor spaces, which helped visually, visually challenge students who had highly photosensitive skin. Um, we adopted a vaulted shell structure framework with form work that could be repeated, which again aided economic, uh, which helped economic costs. We also devised this brick jali system, which aided passive cooling as well as well as served as expelling for expelling hot air. And we were able to make this locally, uh, which also spawned a local economy, uh, which would help at times like these. Uh, we we like the corridors had to be ergonomically designed as well as uh, we had to design the building for a for seismic uh, for a for a seismic earthquake up to six on the Richter scale. Uh, while demolishing the existing building, we kind of used the debris of the demolition as backfill into the foundation of the new building, which also acts as a ballast in terms of an earthquake. Um, in terms of the material palette, we kept it absolutely simple materials that were found locally and something that worked in terms of economy as well as ergonomics. Uh, what we were able to come up with was a very tight, very, a very tight build form, which was able to connect to its surroundings as well. And 
through using these programmatic videos, we were able to kind of convey to the clients just in terms of how we would be laying out the building. So everything went in, in terms of circulation, in terms of activities, in terms of the cords that held the building together. And then the building kind of wrapped around with landscape. Um, a study of a local built fabric helped us in designing the fenestrations of the new building to keep the heat out and to allow for a fantastic cross ventilation. Through the entire project, we were grappled with the idea of how to use space as a social condenser as you know, an armature to kind of facilitate social connections and not hard thresholds which separate the inside and the outside. So the project manifested, manifested in this way as like, you know, with like a surrounding of brick, which is almost diaphanous in the way it feels. And it's got carefully articulated punctures, which, which allow cross ventilation. Uh, each, each fenestration was carefully detailed to inform the program that followed it. Uh, each of the corridors became spaces for social interaction as well as learning, as well as served as a perfect climatic buffer to the hot arid region outside. In terms of programmatic laying out, it was a very simple systematic layout with uh, the quieter learning spaces that went up on the floor above. At, e at each of the steps, we engaged the end users that would be involved so that the spaces that they got in the end are something that they, were, they, they always wanted at, at most of the times we were able, we had to physically mock it up and mark it on site for them as that would be, that was the most easiest way of communication for us. Uh, we also carefully choreographed the process of demolition and we were able to salvage a lot of material that we will be using in the project when we built the new structure. The site is currently uh, cleaned up and lined out and it's all ready to get constructed uh, as soon as the lockdown kind of lifts off. Uh, we were also commissioned to do a housing for factory workers in the town of Yamunanagar near Chandigarh. Yamunanagar is about a two hour drive from Chandigarh. It's a city that's Chandigarh is a city that's designed by Le Corbusier and uh, it kind of played at the back of our minds always when we were designing our spaces. Uh, uh, where our site sits in Yamunanagar is an absolutely industrial context. It has factories that kind of buffer it from all the sites. And we had to design housing for workers that worked in a veneer factory. Uh, while, while, while looking at the process of designing housing for workers, we kind of stumbled upon uh, housing uh, for uh, like uh, the housing typology of the chawl that was used to house mill workers uh, in, in Bombay. And we felt that uh, it, this, this fostered a very great kind of social fabric and it held the residents together. And that's something we kind of translated into our built form as well. Um, while looking at the housing, we were trying to build an argument to house the workers close to the factory. And here we were inspired by the words of Martha Chen, who, who deals with local economies at the Kennedy School of Government. What she says is, uh, we need to come up with a model where the smallest units and the least powerful workers operate alongside the largest units and the most, most powerful economic players. So we had, we had to house 216 workers and they currently housed away from site. And that leads to a lot of cost and time that's wasted in transporting them, as well as it greases the, the carbon footprint. So the argument that we built was we house the 216 workers on a tight footprint within the factory itself. That'll economize time. It'll help structure shifts better as, a, as well as it will be cost efficient and save time. Uh, we then embarked on a very thorough process to, to modulate the best typology for housing these workers. And what we got was, um, we got a mass that was split into three wings, which the service served as well as the recreation. That was all kind of tightly held together with a structure that was cost efficient as well as aesthetic looking. And it housed a very vibrant kind of social, it, it, it trapped a very vibrant social milieu underneath it. Uh, the initial sketches were almost Kanyan in the interpretations of the service versus the servant spaces. And what we were able to kind of formulate was a very efficient housing block module, which was 15 feet by 22 and a half feet at house 12 people. 
both the vertical faces had structure and the lower uh, the shorter faces were at, were punctured to allow for cross circulation cross ventilation to happen um at all this time the looming presence of corbusier never kind of left our mind and we were we used the rhythm of organization in the high court complex and it sort of translated into the organization of our shear walls in in of uh, that separated these built units um and that's how we kind of modulated these units to get the perfect kind of build form for the housing and that was kind of that data was extrapolated um uh, into the making of the final design for it what we what we ended up getting was a section that was that housed all the workers on the site it 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 allowed a lot of light to come into the project it allowed a uh, passive cooling to happen in a very very hot region and it also allowed very strong visual connection between the project which fostered a great kind of social fabric for the workers this was all held together by a very local very economically available built material palette and that was the kind of final manifestation of the project what happens is we have a very tight floor plate which gets populated by these housing units which house the workers uh and that's kind of supplemented by a service core which is uh, linked to the housing spaces by a corridor as well as um uh, by a staircase block and um what what attaches itself as an appendage is um like a recreational block which houses the canteen facilities as well as recreational facilities um i kind of go ahead and that's our kind of understanding or manifestation of how activities will populate this space and uh, just in terms of how the project will look visually when it's complete it's very earthy it's very uh, contextual in the way it kind of sits even the organization is is kind of ordained as per the factory it's kind of, the unit living units sit tightly against each other i with and with a recreational block that's separated by a shizen as well as like there's housing units on the first floor as well as with the school this site is also lined out and we're all ready to start construction as soon as the lockdown ends and we're able to travel to site um we believe the process we follow is malleable and we use it almost academically in all our commissions whether it's uh, single family homes that we're designing in yamuna nagar again this this project is also under construction as well as for houses in larger gated communities uh boiling down to even commercial interiors that we're doing in amdabad this is again a project that's under construction this is a spa um and it also kind of boils down to the smaller finer details on site which come down to the act of making furniture as well as designing small smaller details of it uh we are often asked this question in every presentation that we make is um you know uh we're a very young studio and how is it that you kind of get the projects that you get and we strongly feel that that is because of the methodology that we follow like for example just to enunciate we were commissioned by a client to design a pedestal for for a statue that they had in their office so we went about designing the pedestal in the most academic way possible it was a very rigorous process and they were so enamored by the process that they kind of invited us to design a bar as well as a hangout space for them in their in their uh, uh factory as well as a uh, a uh, when they were happy with that process it kind of translated into us designing a marriage hall for them as well as a crematorium that we're currently doing for them uh, for the town of vijayanagar in which the factory is uh, locates itself so um what we also kind of pride ourselves in is is in the fact that we don't silo ourselves only to the studio and the working the daily workings of the studio we kind of uh have a lot of film screenings and studio visits which keep helping us kind of expand and grow our knowledge as well as we also very actively engage in academics this is a workshop that we did uh, at my alma mater in bombay it's called reconstructing atmospheres and uh, just in terms of utilizing our time during the lockdown just in the words of uh, paul noma paul roma sorry 
uh, he's a Nobel laureate in economics. He says a crisis is a terrible opportunity to waste. So what we did is we kind of pulled in our resources and uh, made uh, made our website as well as augmented our presence on social media. So uh, thank you so much for joining us and giving us your time and attention. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nishant and Studio Unbuild uh, for taking us through your interesting work. Uh, with this, we now open the session for conversation. We invite you, uh, we invite the audience to share your questions uh, for our presenters. Please type in questions you may have for Eugene, Nishant, Varun, Ria. Kindly also leave us some feedback. Uh, I would like to introduce and welcome our moderators for the conversation today, architect Kutubuddin Unbala, who despite the recent unfortunate cyclone destruction caused in Lonavala, has managed to join the conversation. He is a junior architect at Ar architect Shabir Unwala's design workshop. I would also take this opportunity to thank Simran Mehta of our DU team, who diligently prepared to take over Kutub's place today in case, as we were very unsure of his uh, scenario back in Lonavla. Our second moderator for the day is a fourth year architecture student from the Vadiar Center for Architecture, Mysuru, Varun S. Papu. Welcome Varun and Kutub. With this, we open our session for conversation. Thank, uh, am I audible? I hope I am. Thank you for such a kind introduction, Vana. And uh, I'd like to thank uh, both the presenters for such a uh, captivating presentation. I mean, it was just absolutely fantastic to see two studios which are such, uh, with such diverse work, one that is technologically aided and the other which is so rooted in academia. Uh, it is great to see that both of them are so uh, team-oriented and collaborative and intensively process-driven. Uh, I would like to shoot the first question to both of them. Uh, as we have seen in uh, both of their work, materiality plays an integral role to inform their design. Uh, so, but what is more paramount for materiality is uh, is, an, is, is the elemental aspect for UG and the functionality spaces for when it comes to studio unbuild. So my question would be, how do materials and design inform each other? Uh, Nishan, you want to go first or? Sure, absolutely. No, yeah. yeah. So uh, when it comes to, uh, when it comes to our experiments with materials, they're more or less always oriented or they are always a product of economy. Uh, we always try and use uh, like the projects that we're given all, almost always have shoestring budgets. So we need to make them look and feel as premium as possible in the shortest, in the lowest amount of money. So that's when our exploration with material does come in as well. It also helps us in keeping, uh, keep uh, in sort of engaging local players. It's, that, that is something that we that we found quite recently when we were designing the school in Palanpur. We were looking at ways of sourcing bricks, and we weren't able to find a source. But we were able to find a brick kin close close to the city. The kin was almost going to shut down, but just in by conversing with them, we were able to kind of tell them that we would like these specific bricks made and they, they willingly agreed to make it. So in, in our way, in some sense, like just as opposed to building a building and kind of being hands offish with it, we were able to spawn or regenerate or resuscitate a local economy that was dying down. So that's where we feel our exploration in material also kind of it has a more overarching uh, influence as opposed to um, uh, as a has a more overarching influence, yes. Yeah, I think uh, on my side, the approach is a lot more micro. <laughs> it's like we do, we, we kind of like focus on things and we try to uh, see how we can uh, do it in a different way. Um, the lucky thing about since I'm joining Formworks is they give us a little bit of room to do research. Means um, <clears throat> we are not being held back by the economics of the world where as you can see like if you had a project and a budget obviously you need to keep everything on point right but for us 
we were given certain opportunities where yeah, maybe 70 to 80% of the projects are uh, having this kind of like um, so-called brief as a main thing, you know, stay on point. But the uh, when Formworks hired me, they came with the understanding that I'm going to develop the technological aspects of them. So they bought 3D printers for me and with the machining background and all this, um, I start to approach uh, material companies such as laminate companies and all of these other companies and basically propose to them um, small projects which won't cost them a lot of money and at the same time I can investigate the materials itself. And that's kind of how how it works. So I guess that's the balance on my side. Yeah, uh, so the next question is for Eugene. Uh, does the context inform the installation or is it the other way around? Taking the example of the installation, uh, twisted parts where the end user becomes a vital part of the context, how does that affect the design process? Mm. <clears throat> well, for that particular one, it's in uh, uh, it's during Singapore Design Week, so there's a lot of people who are gonna walk through that area. Basically, uh, the thing is like, how do you capture them and make them stay for a moment without making something super strong and monolithic? So. Using those strings is uh, something that works with a budget because there was a budget that was given, it was, wasn't really high, and strings are really cheap. And secondly is also looking at how um, you create something through, like trying to create surfaces through lines and density, which is something that can, you know, is like we, we can achieve pretty easily. Uh, was the other way to to do this, I guess. Um, so coming into it, I would say to answer your question is that the the fact that the event, which is the design week, for the it happens for two weeks. Uh, we know there's a high foot flow uh, of people walking through the space. Uh, that informs us to kind of like understand how we fill this atrium space. So that, that, and we want them to pause and kind of look at this without being overpowered by it, I guess. So yeah, that would be one of the, the reasons uh, how we derive this design, I guess. Um, the next question is for Studio Unbuilt. Um, so uh, Nishant and the team just collaborated with Muse Lab uh, to develop exquisite corpse. Uh, what was your experience in doing that? And what uh, do you think about collaborating with practices that are not essentially into your area of design? Um, so uh, the, the collaboration with Muse Lab was uh, almost like designing a septet where uh, your kind of the hexagon that you designed the design was uh, paired with other interesting combinations and the set and septets were formed. So it was our take on uh, what the future of living could be. It was, it was in this, in, it was in during the lockdown time when we were asked to do it. So it, it had an overarching kind of idea of how it is to be living during the lockdown and how elements that you associate with the outside are now in some ways kind of transformed and the insides of your home become elements of the outside again. So that was an interesting process that we kind of followed uh, when we were designing with, uh, when we were designing for the competition. Uh, in terms of collaborations and in terms of how we kind of take it forward, it, um, it almost becomes, uh, you know, they, they start off as dialogues and they start off as just brief acquaintances, but they, they translate into very valuable inputs into our process. and as our process is, we're super young. So we feel our process is something that we always keep refining and tuning in as uh, tuning as we go ahead. And uh, these collaborations and these sort of uh, engagements help us kind of augment that. It also 
helps strengthen the network and the community, the design community that we are a part of. So we we feel like that's it works in like subliminal like various levels. So that's where we feel like the process of collaboration helps us. Okay, uh, so the next question is aimed to both the speakers. From what we've understood today, it clearly kind of conveys that all design is one design and looking at architecture, interior, product design or art as various components of design is a thing of the past. Uh, process driven, a collaborative work is the need of the art. Having said that, what is the one aspect of design that you would love to collaborate or uh, anyone in particular that you would like to collaborate with? Um, there's no one, there's, there's no one that comes on off the top of my head. Uh, I think, uh, Varun is, uh, he's, he's the guy who does like most of the outreach for us and gets us and like gets us in touch with a lot of people. So I would like Varun to kind of answer this question on behalf of us. Uh, so studio unbuild is a practice, which is not, uh, you know, it's not just about architecture. We are we are overall into like it's an end to end design practice where we do architecture, interior, uh, construction and then furniture. And so uh, we really like to collaborate with artists and craftsmen. So, for example, if we are doing a project in Palanpur, we would like to call it, collaborate with the local artist community of Palanpur. And so uh, we believe that sustainability does just don't come with environment and using the material but a social and economic sustainability is also very important for which architecture would play a very important role in the coming few days. So like same with the collaborating with communities and with the local artisans. Yeah, um, for myself, I guess uh, fashion industry would be kind of interesting uh, with kind of like how do you kind of like create the whole experience, um, not just the product itself. Uh, architecture too, like right now, uh, in Formworks alone, uh, my team parachutes in and work with uh, architects and interior designers. Um, most times we're given a brief, which is kind of nice and easier for us. So they like solve this facade for us. Uh, this We want to create this very complex geometry, but we want to keep it within budget. Can you do a few permutations for us? So those has, have always been fun um, for us to do, uh, to understand where the kind of the architects uh, come from and was it really important to them. But I do uh, want to see what happens when those techniques are applied early on and instead of a reaction to solving a facade budget problem. I think when those <clears throat> um, kind of intelligence are applied early, it will be much more beneficial. And at the same time, the architects will not lose their uh, so-called vision. So probably those are two areas that I think will be super interesting to be a lot more involved in. Uh, so the first question from the audience is from Riddhi Gupta to Nishant and team. Uh, uh, she wants to know that since you've mentioned that you're a very young firm and congratulations on completing one year of Studio mm -hmm. Unbuilt. Uh, she, uh, the question is what drove you to start your own studio? What, what was that one element or uh, anything it could be that drove you to start your own practice? I mean, I can sound extremely poetic and romantic, but to be very fair, it was because uh, we were we were done with like a large chunk of working with various design practices as well as working all around the country. And uh, one of our clients approached us saying that he wasn't very happy with the way the construction of his home was, his vacation home was happening in Kalja. And that kind of set a set a series of events into motion where we kind of helped him out with one house and our synergies kind of like collaborated really well we figured out like you know a, a very symbiotic way of working and that's what we thought we could kind of uh, kind of you know 
formalize that in some sense and set up a studio. Uh, yeah, it, it is a very daunting task to set up a studio yourself and um, just in terms of anticipating the kind of work that you would get. But again, again, like uh, we, 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 we set up the studio with a very kind of crystallized process that we thought we'd always follow for all our projects. And that process has sort of aided us in like, you know, getting projects as well as keeping the studio running. So uh, the initial thing was because we had a client who wanted something done, he approached us and that's how the studio got formed. But to keep the studio going, one project wasn't enough. So that's the process kind of helped us to keep it going. Uh, so we have another question from the audience for Studio Unbuilt. As a new practice, what were some of the challenges for the very first project? Also, in terms of the project brief, did you encounter opportunities to add to the client's list of requirements? And how did you go about convincing the client of the same in any of your projects? True. <laughs> So as a, as a young practice, uh, one of the first projects we got was to design the school for, 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 differently, for the differently able students. So it was, a, it was a daunting brief to begin with. Uh, we were kind of losing ground in terms of where to start. So we literally went to site. We spent a couple of days over there just to kind of understand how things work and how each, how students with, each, with, with disabilities kind of function. And uh, yes, it was, uh, uh, we, we, we would like to say that the clients were extremely sensitive to, uh, to all the proposals that we kind of put forth and they were extremely accommodative and encouraging of the kind, some of the bizarre things we kind of proposed to them. But uh, it worked, it worked like the, it always works it, when you kind of articulate things in a very kind of cohesive manner. So we, that's where we feel like, the element of graphics almost kind of gets very subliminally embedded in the way we kind of present because we feel like re clear cohesive graphics is is something that always helps someone to understand your thought process and when that happens most of the questions or most of the queries that they would have almost almost certainly vanish then it comes down to dealing with budgets and the way we deal with budgets again is um, trying to find more local, more rooted methods of dealing with like, and finding a more cost effective way. And that's something that we invest a lot of time in doing and a lot of research in doing the same. So that's where we feel like the projects, I mean, the, the kind of issues we faced with our first project, yeah. Uh, so the next question is for Eugene. Uh, so what, what what does he perceive as finished or unfinished and what is completeness to him in terms of uh, his, his artwork or his uh, practice in terms of each product or output? Uh, well, I don't think anything's ever finished. <laughs> it's uh, normally we have to show something when it's go time, right? <laughs> but uh, in terms of like what you're interested in, uh, is always evolving. So say like the paintings that I showed, that's been evolving for the since 2012, you know, and I'm still not satisfied. I still can improve it more. But the interesting thing is like the logics of those patterns can be translated into other projects. And that allows you to kind of look at how does that look as in the patterning and the cut pattern, how do you layer it? Uh, you can turn it into a facade system. So the the whole idea of like uh, questioning things, whether it's finished or not, I think it's really more about finding out what the subject is, uh, for the subject of what you want to investigate, and then the matter that goes with it, means the material that plays with it. So when these two things are kind of like taken into consideration, there's a lot of permutation that could happen. So probably on a certain subject uh, applied to a certain material, it maxes out at this, but you can always change that by changing the material itself. And 
um, for me, that's the fun part where <clears throat> uh, as you know, I keep on working on my stuff, I would look around and try to play with all these um, kind of like permutations. So no, I don't think it's ever finished. <laughs> I, I'm sure same thing can be said with Studio on Bill, right? You wish. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely, right? We, we, we wish we have more time, more budget, and more everything, but. Yeah. yeah. That would be ideal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Never done. Also, this is uh, for Eugene from the audience. Uh, wonderful work. What is next in terms of your material investigation and your work forward? Um, I right now is a little bit different. Uh, before I joined Formworks, is more of me, and now I'm kind of like a little dad with a small team of three people, and I'm trying to um, uh, push the agenda of the team instead of my own. So there's a little bit of like a growth in uh, my agenda and what I want to look for. And currently, uh, as I said, like we're given uh, like a 20% of our time to do our own research and what we're interested in. So I just uh, tell the team, um, we just need to fail at the highest level every day because this 20% of our time is time where we can spend resources. Uh, we can pick up new softwares and we just fail every day. And when you fail, you learn something. And that's kind of like the attitude in the team. Um, softwares, whatever software thrown to us, we should not be afraid to pick it up. Whatever material we need to investigate, we should not be afraid to kind of like do something about it. Um, so at the moment, we're looking at a lot of 3D printing technology, to be honest. Um, we got sponsored by Formlabs recently. Uh, so there's a 3D print company that kind of does a SLA where it's not a fixed deposit material. So it's a very nice finish and it can be used for dental or ceramics. And we, we tend to run with uh, whoever wants to support us <laughs> and we try to push it and see how we can apply it to um, whatever projects we have on. Yeah. So yeah, we're looking at 3D printing a lot lately. <laughs> Okay. Is it frozen? We'll continue the question answers on Instagram for whoever's questions haven't been answered yet. I would just like to thank uh, both our presenters and I'd like to uh, bring Simran in next. Uh, I am Simran Mehta, a junior architect with VSLA and a member of the DU team. Thank you, Eugene and Studio Unbill, for your inspiring presentations to our, and thank you to our moderators, Kutub and Varun, for a very interesting conversation. I would like to take this opportunity to urge our viewers to follow Eugene and Studio Unbill on social media to stay updated about their wonderful work. So far, Design United has successfully completed seven installments of Design Conversations, and we have many more exciting speakers lined up with designers from across the spectrum joining us to share their thoughts. Next week, we have uh, Nashara Balgamwala from Harvard, USA, and OBS, an experimental action and research collective based not in not only Mumbai, but also in Sao Paulo and Seoul. So make sure you join us next Saturday for this fascinating discussion. Design, Un Design United is a platform and a collaborative space where we encourage everyone to collaborate with us and connect with us. So uh, feel free to connect and join. We're always on the look for volunteers who are enthusiastic about design. Uh, also do follow us on Instagram for updates. Thank you.
Thanks for having us, guys. Thank you. Thank you so much for having.